the first way I'd always describe myself is, is as a historian. And from that flows the various different things that I do in my life. I write non-fiction history books, I teach, I make history programs, and I write historical fiction, but history underpins all of them. Uh, my first fiction editor, actually, and still my fiction editor, said to me uh, 10 years ago when I was writing my first book, he said, Saul, you've got to remember, I know you're a historian, and this may sound counterintuitive, but you've got to remember the history is secondary, the story is first. The Prince and Whitechapel murders is uh, odd, in two ways. It's the third of a series, and the series involves this um, character, George Hart, who comes from a very conflicted background. So he is someone of mixed heritage who never quite sees the empire from the kind of traditional British angle. He's always seeing it from both sides. There was a hiatus, so I wrote the first two books quite quick, quite close together in 2009, 2010, and then there's a bit of a gap. And when I come back to fiction, uh, my editor says to me, have you thought of adding an element of crime? And I said, well, no, not really. But if I do that, can we carry on with the adventure series? And as I began to think about it, I realised, actually, do you know what? It would make much more sense to set it in London. And if I set it in London, I need a reason for him to be, be here. But I also need a real figure that he's interacting with. And so I did a little, little bit of uh, digging into royal figures of the period, because George's father is potentially royal. And... I find this extraordinary character, who's the eldest son of the Prince of Wales, the womanising Prince of Wales we all know as Bertie, his son, not very well known to history, a man called Prince Albert Victor. When you begin to look into the details of his life, his relatively short life, you realise there are a lot of sort of dark elements to him. Now, what, what were these dark elements? Well, he was probably homo homosexual at a time when it was a criminal offence to be homosexual. So this is a major problem for the royal family, if it's known, if he is, and if it's known he is, th th there's a serious scandal brewing here. But the, the homosexuality thing, obviously that, that, that's a reason, but there's not enough jeopardy there. So who else, what, what else was going on in London at that time that could have been a major threat to a member of the royal family? So I began to look at the, you know, what, what what, what was in the headlines at that time. And I discovered that there was a serious threat from Irish terrorists, basically Republican terrorists, known as Fenians at the time. So now we've got the potential homosexual blackmail, but we've also got the threat to his life. You know, I mean, on the one hand, you, you, you would be naturally a bit wary of the Ripper murders because they're so well known. But on the other hand, if my remit is to have a crime scenario in London, what better, first of all, for the name check uh, factor, secondly, for the whole jeopardy, because the interesting thing about a criminal case like that is we know how it turned out, which is we don't know who did it. But it's, it's gold dust for a, for a fictional writer in a way because it's got the... It's got the familiarity, but it's also got the mystery. And I say this absolutely without um, you know, suggestion of exaggeration, that I never would have taken on the Ripper case as a non-fiction writer. I think it's madness, because there is too much we will never know. But as a fiction writer, it's, it's brilliant. The main plot is, is oblique. That is, it's, it's tangential to the, to the Ripper murders. So... It, you know, it's not the story of the Ripper murders per se, but of course George gets George and the Prince, is he the murderer or not, get drawn increasingly into the detail of the Ripper murders, so that by the end of the book, really, that's the that's the focus. I must admit, I've really enjoyed the crime elements. Actually, I mean, it's well known from a commercial point of view that the crime is a seller. And that's, there's no doubt that that was in the mind of my editor when he said, mm, Saul, maybe you think about crime. But actually the process of crime, which is a terrible thing happens, uh, someone comes in and has to find some way of resolving it. He never quite knows who's good and who's bad. You know, a lot of the kind of great themes in classical literature, I suppose, are present in the crime novel. It's, it still brings in all the, all the elements of drama and jeopardy that, I like to include even in my non-fiction, which is probably why I write about conflict, um, because that's where people have to make these really tough decisions. And, and, you know, in war or conflict, usually you see the best and the worst of people, and it's probably the same with crime. 
So there are a lot of ifs here. If I was to do another novel, because I've already got non-fiction um, uh, commitments, uh, but if and when I do another novel, it would probably be crime. And if it was to be crime, I think I would choose a similar scenario to The, Mur the, the Ripper Murders. That is one of the great unsolved crimes. Um, most modern crime writers, of course, make up their crimes, as it were. You know, it's purely fictional. Um, but when you're working in the past, yes, of course, you could do that. But I, you know, having gone through the process of having all this wonderful material that, you know, I'll leave it to the judgment of my readers, but to have this source material of the way they spoke, the way the police operated, the way the post-mortems were conducted, the way the East End looked in the late 19th century, gives, I think, the book a wonderful authenticity, even if you question elements of the plot, which are obviously a part of it are, are, are going to be fictional. But you give this wonderful feel of that time through, through the detail. And so I would quite like to do that with another crime, but it would have to be, it would have to be another of the great unsolved crimes. And just off the top of my head, there is one thing that's always been in the back of my mind for a long time. I almost wrote a non-fiction book about the only... Um, British soldier to be executed for a military offence in the Second World War. And this one soldier, a man called Schurch, who had some um, Austrian background, was eventually believed by the British to be a traitor, spying for the Germans or the Axis, and he was executed. The question was, what, what, but, but just before his execution, he recanted his confession and said, no, it's not true. I was a bit of a fantasist. And there is an element of doubt as to exactly who he was, what he was up to, and this big missing period, which he, the British claim he was spying, but he claims I just deserted. That's a possibility. Um, but something like that, I think, with still a big element of uncertainty, but with a, a framework of, of facts. The last thing to say about the business of fiction writing is that I do it... Uh, not full-time, I kind of come back and forth to the writing of fiction. Usually there's a hiatus because I'm, I've then got a non-fiction book, it might be a bit of telly, certainly there's a bit of journalism, there's publicity, you know, I've been involved in the making of a film over the last couple of years. And But fiction is, the interesting thing about fiction is that you get a feeling that you own the story for obvious reasons much more than any other thing I've done, you know, presenting documentaries, writing non-fiction books. Of course, they're all your product, but fiction is entirely yours. And so there's something wonderful about it that as long as I've given the opportunity, I'd like to come back to do again.